Hello, and welcome to the Intro to Thermodynamics screencast. I'm Mrs. Willie, and let's get started. Let's start with a little refresher on energy. Energy is the measure of ability to do work. There are seven types of energy, mechanical, radiant, sound, chemical, electrical, nuclear, and thermal. We have touched on nuclear, electrical a little bit when we talk about the conductivity of metals, and we're gonna focus on chemical and thermal energy in this unit. We only know when energy is present when it is transforming from one form to another. So as scientists, we look at the measurement of what's happening as we go or when we transform from one form of energy to another, we look at the measurement of that. So let's start with chemical energy since this is pre-AP chemistry. We're going to focus a lot in this unit on the chemical energy and the change that occurs during chemical reactions and physical changes. So chemical energy is the energy gained or released from chemical and or physical changes. Remember, chemical changes are reactions where you have bonds breaking and forming and there are signs of a chemical reaction. Your geologists love their silent phones acronym. And then we're also going to look back at phase changes and the state of energy when you are in particular states of matter. So kinetic energy is going to focus largely in this unit on particle vibration in solids or particle movement in liquids and gases and the energy of movement of atoms or compounds to create and break bonds. So we have a change in kinetic energy here. We have a change in kinetic energy here. We have different levels of kinetic energy in a solid versus a liquid versus a gas. And then you have movement of electrons in a metallic bond that would also be kinetic energy. Temperature is the measure of kinetic energy. It is not kinetic energy itself. So this is a big student misconception that the thermometer is kinetic energy. It is not. It is a measure of the kinetic energy or average kinetic energy in an object. So we're gonna really focus on that forces of attraction between compounds and between particles within an object. So potential energy is due to the position of the object. It is stored, so I have potential energy stored inside these bonds that can be released when I break them and then there are also potential energy stored inside the particles as you go through states of matter. And in fact, as you go through the state, that's when you have a change in potential energy. Strong bonds have low chemical energy and weak bonds have high chemical energy. So that is why you have a uh, low or weak chemical energy in a gas, but combustion reactions usually yield high amounts of energy. It's due to that contradictory thinking in that there is a weak chemical attraction which allows you to release large amounts of chemical energy. So let's focus on endothermic changes. You may have heard the term endothermic before. The system absorbs energy from the surroundings. So the container that's holding the system, so the system is what we're looking at as a scientist, could be anything. This could be an object. This could be 
a reaction. So you're contacting, you're touching the surroundings, not the system. Therefore, that system is absorbing your energy and that is why it feels cold. In a chemical change, the potential energy of the products is greater than the potential energy of the reactants. The Q, the variable Q, which is the heat energy transfer, is positive or the energy is written as a reactant in the chemical reaction. So as you can see down here in our example, in the chemical reaction of ammonium chloride and water, you have heat as a reactant. So this indicates to me that this is an endothermic reaction because heat is written as a reactant and not as a product. It could also be written to the side of an equation as Q and a positive numerical value. Breaking a chemical bond is always endothermic. So breaking those bonds on the reactant side is always endothermic. It must overcome the potential energy inside the bond by adding more energy than the bond holds in order for it to break. Other examples of endothermic changes are photosynthesis and melting and evaporation. So again, contradictory to what your brain wants to tell you, but if you think about it, as I'm melting, I'm going from a solid to a liquid, therefore I need to absorb energy. The same as I'm going from a liquid to a gas, I would need to absorb energy to do so. So the flip side of this is an exothermic change. This is where the system releases heat to the surrounding. So now I'm looking at an object or a chemical reaction and as I touch the container, the container is going to feel hot because the system, whether that be an object or a react chemical reaction, is now releasing energy in the form of heat to its surroundings. We are the surroundings. In a chemical change, the potential energy of the reactants is greater than the potential energy of the products. Therefore, that Q value, the heat energy transfer, is negative or it's written as a product. So in the carbon tetrahydride plus oxygen reaction, you can see this is combustion because I have oxygen as a reactant. There's a large amount of heat that is going to be released as a product. So I could also write this over as Q equals, and this time I'm going to have a negative value, a negative numerical value. Forming new chemical bonds is always exothermic. So thinking about these forming, it's going to become stable or be more stable than what was happening on the reactant side. Therefore, it's going to release that energy. Uh, also, some examples are burning and rusting of iron and then condensation and freezing. So if I'm thinking about this, again, contradictory, as I'm going from a gas to a liquid, I'm going to be releasing energy because my particles are going to have less average kinetic energy. So I'm going to release that energy. The same as I go from a liquid to a solid, I'm going to be releasing energy here as well. So now let's shift from chemical energy to thermodynamics and thermal energy. Heat energy transferred from one object to another. There are three types of heat energy transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. So conduction is transferred by direct contact. As you can see in my image down here, there's a Bunsen burner that is lit, that is heating up this metal rod, we will say, and that heat is directly touching the person. So I'm coming into direct contact with the heat. 
Convection is transfer or heat energy transfer via mass motion of molecules. This could be air or water currents. So in your image, you have cooler water that is, sorry, cooler air that is coming in from the window and it gains energy, kinetic energy or heat from the room and becomes warm and then circulates down as it cools and then it keeps blowing around and around and that turns into a circular motion. The last form I wanna talk about of heat energy transfer is radiation. This is heat transfer via waves. So remember back when we talked about electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation in unit three? This is exactly what's happening here, so think there are waves coming off of that campfire that you feel as you're making s'mores on the campfire. So another great example that shows all three forms of heat energy transfer is when you are heating water on a stove. So the metal pot that you are heating comes into direct contact with the stove, the heat here, and then the cooler water is on the bottom and it circulates up it's, as it gains kinetic energy, then it falls back down as it cools and creates those convection currents in the water. And then you have radiant transfer of heat from the actual metal itself as the pot starts to heat and the water begins to boil and turn into a gas. So an example of thermal equilibrium in the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law of thermodynamics basically states that all objects or systems want to come into equilibrium with their surroundings. So in our first example here, you have a solid substance at 10 Kelvin which is at a low temperature, and then it is in a high temperature environment. So you have 300 Kelvin as your surroundings. So in this case, there is a large amount of heat transfer being absorbed from our surroundings into our system. Therefore, this would be a endothermic process. In our second example, you have a solid substance at 200 Kelvin, which is at a higher temperature, in a 50K environment, which is at the lower temperature. And so as you can see, there's energy transfer between the object and the surroundings. There's just a larger transfer from the hotter object system or surroundings based on energy flow. And thermal equilibrium is always from hot to cold. So there's a larger heat energy transfer from the hot system to the cooler surroundings, which would make this an exothermic process. Both of these are going to get to Thermal equilibrium, which is our last example here, a solid substance existing in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings. So in both of those two previous examples, we will eventually come into thermal equilibrium where they both have the same average kinetic energy. So again, the zeroth law is just stating that all objects want to come into thermal equilibrium with their surroundings and they do so um, from hot to cold. Next, the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So we need to go over some vocabulary here. The universe, which is equal to the system and the surroundings. This is not the stars and the planets that you are thinking of when you think of the term universe. 
So we're going to go ahead and rewire your brain to think about universe in the terms of system plus surroundings. The system is the part of the universe we are studying. So in our previous slide, we were studying the object as our system and how the surroundings, which was the atmosphere, was interacting with that object. As chemists, we look at reactions, um, so chemical processes and changes, and then we're also looking at physical changes and processes because in both of those cases, we have forces of attraction, both in chemical bonds and in uh, forces or bonds between molecules or formula units. Surroundings is literally everything else. So everything else that is in and around your object that you are studying. If you are in the room in our last example, you are part of the surroundings. So the total energy of the universe remains constant. So you have heat transfer between the system and its surroundings. We usually measure temperature changes in the surroundings because it's easier. You do not want to stick your fire directly, or you're sorry, your hand directly into a fire to try and determine what the temperature of that fire is. So we're going to measure the temperature of the surroundings around the fire because it is easier to do so. So let's do an example together. Which sample has a higher average kinetic energy to start? So I'm looking at this glass of water that has an ice cube over here. So the liquid water is at 25 degrees Celsius and the solid water is at negative five degrees Celsius. We know that the higher the temperature, the higher the average kinetic energy. So we're going to say that the 25 degree Celsius liquid water has a higher kinetic energy to start. And then your negative five degrees solid water is going to have lower kinetic energy to start. So which sample loses heat to the other? So we have to think about this. Which one is losing to the other? We know that hot goes towards cold as from the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So that means that the liquid water is going to be losing heat to the solid water. So the liquid is losing to the solid. Which sample gains the heat? Well, we know that the surroundings and the system transfer to each other. And so the liquid water is going to be surroundings and it's going to lose it's heat because in the zeroth law, you hot move, hot moves to cold. So the solid water is going to gain the kinetic energy or absorb the kinetic energy being given off by the liquid water. Both samples will eventually have the same temperature, and this is going to be through conduction because that's direct contact between the two. And what range will the final temperature be? So we know that these are going to be eventually be the same temperature, so that temperature has to be somewhere in between the negative five and the 25 degrees Celsius. The system is our solid water. The surroundings, because that is what you would contact, 
is going to be the surroundings. And then the universe is the solid plus the liquid plus the container. So what other factors might affect the final temperature reached by both objects? So we know that there are insulators and there are conductors. So the material at which the container that we're studying this system in is going to definitely affect whether or not we have a direct heat transfer between the liquid and the solid or if we're losing kinetic energy through uh, radiant heat from the outside of the container. So we know that there are going to be times, plus there is no lid on our container, so you're going to be losing energy to the surroundings outside of the container. And so we know that this is not a perfect system and that there are flaws. But for our purposes in an introduction, we are going to do everything we can as scientists to limit the error and the loss of heat transfer. I hope you enjoyed this screencast and I will see you next time.